As we begin this lecture, which will focus on one of the most famous studies of natural selection in the wild, I want to do a quick reminder. If there is going to be natural selection on a population, there need to be three characteristics in place. Number one, there needs to be some amount of variability. If everything is identical, then there's no differences to select upon. Number two, some of that variability needs to be inherited. And it doesn't need to be 100%, but it does need to be, some of it needs to be inherited, meaning it has a genetic component. Now, the more a trait is inherited, meaning if it's 100% genetic versus 20% genetic, the more of a genetic component there is for a specific trait, the more it can be impacted by natural selection. Okay? But it doesn't have to be 100%. If there's any genetic component at all, natural selection can work on it. And then finally, there needs to be differential success that is based on that variability. Some characteristics need to have better success than others, and if that's so, then natural selection will be able to work on that trait. Now, I want to define a term. It's done a little bit later in another one, but this is an, an important uh, concept here called character displacement. And it applies to the finches, but to many, many other species also. Character displacement refers to when there are different pathways to success. And often what that means is that Individuals on one extreme might be able to do well by exploiting a certain niche in the ecosystem, and other individuals in the species, maybe at a different extreme, may also be able to do well by uh, exploiting a opposite trait. So, for instance, if you were living on an island where there were both small seeds that were easy to eat and you, had, you needed a small beak to pick them up, and also very large seeds that you need a large beak to crack them up, crack and pop them open, then individuals on either extreme of that phenotype would be able to do well, right? And so over time, we might see specialization and even separation between two parts of the population. So that is character displacement. And it's especially extreme when there is population pressure, when there are lots and lots of individuals that are all competing for a limited number of resources. In those instances, specialization is more often a good thing. And we can see this over and over again in Darwin's finches. Uh, these are a group of birds that are found on the Galapagos Islands, and they become famous in evolution because Darwin noticed some of the differences. And it's interesting because when Darwin found them, he was not an ornithologist, was not a specialist, and he didn't even realize that they were all so closely related to one another because morphologically they were quite different from the ancestor, which was a finch from the mainland. And they had diverged very rapidly over about a million years, which is a short period of time in an evolutionary frame. And they had diverged into all these many species, some which were found across the islands, others were found only on one or two islands. So there's a very interesting uh, pattern. And so in a way, the finches and many other species on the Galapagos Islands were a waiting data set that scientists could study and explore. And in many ways, the Galapagos Islands and other islands also are a natural laboratory for evolution because they have many conditions that make it easier to measure and study the forces of natural selection and genetic drift and even new mutations, but especially natural selection and genetic drift. So the Galapagos Islands are a really good example for a number of reasons. Some of it is historical because Darwin landed there and began to study and, and, and talk about the organisms there. That gave it a boost. But there are also a lot of really good uh, features that recommend the Galapagos Islands for the study of natural selection. There are many of them. So they are separated sometimes by large uh, swaths of ocean. Other times they're very close to one another. And so this subdivides the population. And on these islands, there are often different conditions. They're fairly dry for the most part, but there are some areas that have more water versus less water, sometimes on the same island or different islands. So there are different environments that organisms are exposed to. Some other interesting features. And if these features weren't in place, the Galapagos Islands might still be a good laboratory, but these features make them unique. There's a strong southerly current called the Humboldt Current that runs up the west coast of South America. And it's quite a cold current, so it brings nutrients in cold water up from the south, 
and also means that the waters around the Galapagos Island are much colder than they would be naturally. They're right on the equator, yet they have quite cold and nutrient-rich waters, which is fairly unusual for uh, islands on the equator. Uh, just as an example, there's actually some penguins that live in the Galapagos Islands, and they are the further, the furthest north of any penguin, uh, and they are able to survive there because of that cold current. This current and wind patterns, prevailing wind patterns, also isolate it somewhat from the Americas, although it's not all that great geographically distant, especially compared to other islands like Easter Island, which is way, way down here, somewhere in over well, the map of the Galapagos Islands is covering them up, but very remote here or Hawaii. There are other rem more remote islands. But because of currents and wind patterns, the Galapagos Islands is still somewhat isolated from the mainland. So when animals make it there, it's a fairly rare event, and they often have very limited competition when they made it there because there were not a lot of other animals from the mainland getting in. And so somewhere, a finch, maybe even a single, it's hypothesized a single finch population was able to establish itself on the Galapagos Islands about a million years and have moved around and migrated and spread across the island since then. But all of these diverse species descended from that one ancestral founding finch from the mainland. So it's a really great uh, way to study the origin of new species, the change in traits, and how rapidly those, cha those traits may change. Perhaps the most famous example, certainly the most well-studied, uh, is a group of finches that live on this tiny little island that is called Daphne Major. Now, if we look at the big map here, just for reference sake, Santa Cruz is one of the larger islands. I think it's the third or fourth largest island in the group. And just north of that is this tiny little volcanic cone. This is a picture of Daphne Major. So it's this little tiny island. There's no fresh water on the island. There's no permanent human habitation. It hasn't been impacted much as much as some of the other ones by uh, people bringing in new species or farming or other things. So it's fairly natural to what it's been like for the last millions of years. And this became a really good and valuable place to study the evolution of these finches. And so uh, two researchers, husband and wife researcher team, the Grants, Peter and Rosemary Grant, back in the 70s, established research stations there. It was quite logistic, a big logistic challenge, lots of work. And so year after year after year, they and some of their students would go to the island and gather data and study and look at uh, organisms. They were primarily interested in the finches. Now, one of the reasons it was such a great study island is it was fairly isolated. There wasn't a ton of migration, so they could pretty much eliminate influ influences of migration. And there were a limited number of birds on the island. One of the birds was the medium ground finch. It was the most common bird, and there were others that would be there from time to time. And what they noticed is that there was variation in the beak size of these medium ground finches. Some of them had larger beaches, beak sorry, larger beaks, and others had smaller beaks. And they hypothesized that that might help them specialize on different types of seeds. The larger, the, the finches are seed eaters, although some of Darwin's finches have adapted away from eating seeds to adapt to eat other things. But on Daphne Major, they're still seed eaters. And so they thought that the bigger beaked individuals would do well with the large seeds, which were on the island, and there was another common small seed, and the smaller ones would do better there. And so when they started looking at it, they noticed that there didn't appear to be a real extreme difference, that the large beak birds would eat large and small seeds. They'd do a little bit better eating the large seeds. And the small beak birds would eat small ones, but they'd eat some large ones also. And so there wasn't a huge immediate thing that jumped out at them. So they said, well, let's look at whether this trait is heritable. And so they measured the beaks, and they could do this because the small population, still lots and lots of work. But they measured the beaks of parents, and then they measured the beaks size of their offspring, and they noticed, sure enough, there's a very strong correlation with some variability, so it's not 100% inheritable, but a pretty strong correlation between beak size, both in the length of the beak and in the depth, how tall it is from the top to the bottom. So after thousands upon thousands of measurements, they established it was a heritable trait. And so they said, well, let's watch it for a little while. There doesn't seem to be a really strong pattern initially, but let's watch and see what happens. Now, in a natural laboratory, you don't have the ability to um, manipulate different conditions, right? You can do this in lab studies, although those are very limited usually, smaller populations, limited number of influences. But in the natural laboratories, you just kind of have to wait. 
And the grants were fortunate, I guess is the right word, um, although it wasn't real fortunate for the birds, that shortly after they started studying these birds, there was a major drought. And during this major drought, all of the small seeds on the island basically disappeared. The plants that produced those small seeds couldn't germinate. Um, there were still some few seeds buried in the soil, and so they could come back when the rain came back. But the drought was long enough and severe enough that it had a radical Im impact on the species. And so what this meant is that the small seeds, which were the main foods, food source for the birds with the smaller beaks, were just gone. And only larger seeds were available. And so they were able to measure a dramatic shift. So here are some graphs. I just want to talk you through what these graphs mean. These are right before the draft, the draft, sorry, right before the drought. The light blue bars represent beak sizes. On average, you know how many birds fall between a certain range of the beak sizes. So light blue is before the drought. And then after the drought, notice there are many fewer birds. And not only that, but the average beak size has dramatically shifted towards the birds with a larger beak. Very few individuals with small beaks survived, but much more a higher percentage of the large-beaked individuals survived. And so then they said, oh, that's going to have an impact on next year's population. And sure enough, the offspring showed about the same average, about the same numbers more or less, but they had shifted dramatically to the right to have larger beaks. So within just this one single year, there was a dramatic shift, quite significant, in the overall beak size of this species. And they continued to watch and measure over the other years. And about a decade later, a little less, there was a very wet period. And so there were lots and lots of tiny seeds available. And in wet periods, the birds with smaller beaks that can efficiently eat the small seeds do much better because there are more of those small seeds available. And sure enough, they saw, though it was not quite as strong, they saw a shift back towards what was originally. And actually, since then, as there have been wet years in the intervening years, beak size has gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. So here we see this dramatic and very rapid increase in beak size right during the drought. And then it kind of settles down, and the birds on average have larger beaks. And then we see wet years, and there's a dramatic drop. Kind of stays the same. Another very, very wet year. And sure enough, we see a corresponding drop in the size of the beaks. So this is a really great study that illustrates what Darwin had already been writing about and knew about, but illustrates it very, very clearly. And so there are two take-home messages from this and further subsequent studies, both in the finches and in other species. Number one is that in natural environments, natural selection is often very unpredictable. It varies from one year to the next. And this is because many environments are not stable. So if there's not a clear trend, you have dry years and wet years and dry years and wet years. If they had just sampled at the beginning and then come back and sampled 20 years later, they would say, oh, look, there's no evolution going on here because they ended up about the same as they did. Now, if they'd come back maybe 30 years later, then they might see a little bit of a, of a change, but they would have missed all of this intervening uh, fluctuation due to the unpredictability of the environment. And so that's very often the case is that in natural populations, you'll see, see things fluctuate up and down and, and you know, what larger versus smaller body size or beak size or color or whatever it might be, depending on that variability in the environment. And then the second take-home message is that when conditions are right, when the environment changes drastically uh, and it's an environment that has a role in determining the fitness of a certain physical trait, then that physical trait will change rapidly also. Now imagine if this drought had persisted year after year after year. We would probably see continued pressure and maybe even continue rising, maybe even pushing it to an extreme and losing much of the genetic variability that accounted for the small beaks. So if there are trends in environment where year after year after year we see the changes occurring, the natural selection will continue to be pushed in that direction. But with fluctuation also comes different, different natural selection on traits.